As many of you have likely realized, society as a whole is failing, or at least you realize something is terribly wrong. You must start setting up alternative communities in order to survive and even thrive moving forward. I'm going to cover a great deal of different community structures in this video, from household communities, neighborhoods, homesteads, the Hutterites, the Amish, to sustainable and resilient farming operations. Community building moving forward may be the most important topic I could ever discuss, so stick around, let's get to it. Over the years, I've heard over and over again from people who have realized something is seriously wrong with society, that we should all start a community, or we should buy land together and start a community. And yet, I've rarely seen anyone successfully do so. Any successful community of any sides needs to have shared values. Sometimes this is religion, beliefs, politics, language, etc. Before I dive into all this, I just want to say that I'm really trying to analyze community structures and societal systems and I'm really trying to leave my personal opinions out of it. I simply want to understand completely how this all works and make proper decisions and maybe help others to understand as well. It is some beefy content so I had to make myself some notes again so I don't waste anybody's time with my unorganized ramblings and it's a lot of information to cover so I want to make sure it's in proper order. A community that survives and thrives has to be economically viable, as in produce more than it consumes. If it consumes more than it produces, it fails. This should be just common sense. Yes, a community can produce things to either be consumed within the community or transacted within the community, but this is still being economically viable. Also, communities have to engage in capitalism outside the community to get resources that the community can't produce itself. This may come as a surprise to you, and don't turn off the video when you hear me say this. Actually, I can't believe this, these words are going to come out of my mouth. I am a communist. What did he just say? <laughs> Actually, every nuclear family is communist. A nuclear family has a provider and dependents, and all work together for the good of the household. Now, my household transacts with other individuals and communes in the form of... Capitalism. What the heck is this guy talking about? <laughs> It's very important to understand these natural and basic systems when talking about building communities. As the head of my household, it is my duty and my privilege to look after my dependents. I go out into the free market and provide value to others in return for other goods and services that my family needs. Yes, we produce much of our own food and consume it amongst ourselves. And yes, we share in chores and have all different responsibilities around the house, homestead and farm. But there are many things that we can't produce ourselves. So my household, which is a working form of communism, engages in capitalism, selling what we produce in excess and purchasing what we do not or cannot produce ourselves. Such as natural gas, internet, phone, Ziploc bags, coffee, work boots, plant trays, sprinkler lines, and the list goes on and on. What an incredible amount of benefits the free market has provided. Maybe our household grows apples in excess and then trades with another household who grows oranges. Both households win. Capitalism doesn't work on a nuclear household level. When children sit down at the dinner table with their parents, the parents don't tell the kids, that'll be $8 for supper, boys. The kids would be like, Dad, I'm only three years old. I don't have any money. And I don't say, well, son, no money, no food. And also, I don't consider it charity feeding my family. Many countries think that communism works on a large scale. Actually, communism always fails on a large scale, has never worked in the long term, and is actually an attack on actual communism, which is a natural system and works as it should on a small scale. Stay tuned for my favorite real world example, the Hutterites who flourish on a small scale, but start to fail when they get too big. So they split off and form other thriving small communes that engage in capitalism. As I study different societal systems, it would seem the blame for many issues we all face is from systemic communism, which doesn't work on a large scale and never will, has waged war on real communism, which is a natural system that always works in its natural smaller state. Politicians pretend to be adults and voters are the dependents, but in reality, politicians are also dependent children elected by many other dependent children who in turn vote for more allowance with less chores or no chores at all and no responsibilities at all either at the expense of the few adults 
whose vote no longer counts. So my first example of a community is simply the traditional nuclear family as the community. In a traditional nuclear family, the man would typically be the provider who would work to gather resources, aka capitalism, for his household, aka communism. And the woman, who has to give birth to the children, would nurture their children and look after the household while the man protects them and provides for them. The children would learn from both parents, both parents would teach their children, and once the children were of a certain age, they would begin to share in some of the responsibilities of their community, aka household. First by cleaning up after themselves, cooking, household chores, homestead chores like collecting eggs, making sure animals have food and water, watering and weeding the garden, all for the betterment of the household, aka communism. After all, a good community should be a team. Plus, all this contribution to the household is teaching valuable life skills better the children's future. For me personally, everything I'm doing and building, I already consider to be my children's. They are three boys, three, two, and two, by the way. The land, the farm, business, orchard, greenhouse, house, all of my possessions. In fact, some of the 7,500 trees my wife and I have planted so far, we might not even get to enjoy because we'll be long dead but we planted them for our children. Now, of course, it's completely up to all three of my boys what they want to do when they're old enough to decide for themselves, but hopefully with my guidance, one or two or all of them will be thrilled to continue what I'm building, expand on it in some form or another. If they choose another road after my guidance, I will not only give them my blessing, but I will help them start their own homestead, aka community. There are some issues with the nuclear family, of course, because of macro-communism destroying communism that actually works. The husband and father has been replaced by the government who extorts the husband and father, redistributes it where the government sees fit. This, of course, means the mother doesn't need a husband to provide and protect her and the children, but the government as a whole will, which often leads to a broken household as the husband and father isn't needed in the household anymore. He is simply supposed to work and build everything and give it to the government. In other words, this is the destruction of communism that actually works, small-scale communism. It will be difficult and impossible to simply pass the torch to the next generation in my community, aka household, as the government will have their hand out when it comes time to pass the torch. I have heard of countless stories of inheritance tax forcing people to sell their farm, so essentially the system confiscates their community. It's no wonder there's no work ethic and men and women decide not to even bother having kids at all in this failing society when you think about it. What's the point? It's an overwhelming amount of work and responsibility as well on just two adults in a nuclear family. The father is exhausted trying to provide and the mother is even more exhausted with the even more important role of childcare and keeping up with the household. Also, from a security perspective, a lone nuclear family doesn't have much protection, as it's simply not many people to stand against any opposing force. A slightly scaled-up model from a nuclear family is the multi-generational family as the community structure. Most people on the planet live with multiple generations and extended families. It's just Western society that doesn't anymore. This simply means multiple generations of your own family, or even extended family, living together in very close proximity. Maybe the grandparents come to live with the nuclear family, instead of living out their golden years in an old folks home away from family. And maybe instead of punting out your kids when they're 18 and out of high school, maybe you offer them the opportunity to stay and include them in your community. Or maybe it's an aunt, uncle, brother, sister that's getting screwed by the system and would be a huge benefit to your household. Maybe grandpa can pass on some of his knowledge to the younger generations about fixing things, etc. Or grandpa can help with some of the more tedious little tasks that just take time but not a lot of physical effort and he loves doing anyway. Maybe grandma can help the younger generations make her homemade jam recipe or she can spend time putzing in the garden that many grandmas love doing anyways. More time with grandkids is the highlight of many grandparents' lives, at the same time freeing up some time for the parents who can tend to the more strenuous tax, tasks like working, building, maintenance, chores, business, and some other tasks that our more elderly generation can't do but needs done. No sending kids to a strange daycare either. If all these generations were living in the immediate vicinity, even under the same roof, it benefits the community as a whole. One person is cooking anyway, so just use a larger pot or pan and cook for a few more people. Or get help when cooking. 
or take a day off from cooking and the next day. Or maybe grandma and grandpa never have to cook again. Instead of two internet bills, just have one. Instead of multiple $50 a month natural gas meter rental bills, whether you use natural gas or not, just have one. Instead of multiple water softeners, just have one. Heck, grandpa might even have a certain tool that the father doesn't have and vice versa. Instead of multiple cars with large operating costs like licensing, just share vehicles. Have a commuter car, a van, and a truck if anybody needs a truck. One flat deck trailer, one chicken coop with one set of daily store chores instead of two, one rototiller with one larger garden instead of hauling the rototiller across town, grocery trips, cut them in half, mailing a parcel, I'll drop it off next time I go into town, someone gets sick, take over the chores for a day or two. And for a security aspect, simply more people is more resilient and a harder target. On a typical day, someone would always be home. If the world gets crazy, shifts can be taken for night watch and everyone can always get the necessary rest needed, something that is hard to do with just a nuclear family. Multiple families are small communities living in close proximity and working together. This is simply surrounding yourself in close proximity to other families and small communities with your same values. It could be a few houses on a city street, a whole city block, multiple families actively moving to a small town and making that small town their own, or rural areas where all your neighbors are on the same page with similar values and actively choosing that location to be in proximity to you. Now I'm talking about each family household having their own title to their own property, not somehow living all together on the same titled property. This creates a form of resilience in case one household gets hit by a divorce, has personal problems, or just decides to sell for whatever reason and try something else. One of the hardest things for an alpha or individualist male to do is work together in a partnership or a communal structure. In my experience, the slightest difference in opinion will drive two individualists apart as well as alphas try to assert dominance and take over leadership of a community. For this reason, the alpha male needs to have ownership of their own domain and their own household and family. So alphas and individualists can work together in close proximity while ma maintaining their own domain. With enough families on the same page, you can set up your own daycare, schools, or even have influence to change policy at existing schools or local government. From a security aspect, neighborhood watches can be set up. If one household or farm family is under some kind of attack, the others in your community can come to the aid. I personally think that this method of living in close proximity to others with your same values is just complementary to how you make your own internal community and complementary to any internal community that you set up. One very good example of, of this is a town in South Africa called Orania. If you aren't aware of the situation in South Africa, it's essentially race related where the majority race is murdering and stealing the farms of the minority race, not only by the individuals, but also with government support. Some of the best communities were started out of sheer necessity and survival. This town was started out of necessity and quickly grew to a community of nearly 2,000 people with the same values. They have their own economy, their own security and numbers, and even their own currency. Another word for a community of families living in close proximity who share the same values is a no-go zone. A no-go zone simply means that anyone who is not part of that community knows that screwing with that community is very dangerous. Hence why numbers in a community make it very resilient from outside threats of any kind. Another example of a no-go zone is Muslim communities who recently immigrated to Europe. Because Western societies as a whole is a dying system, there aren't even common values of Western society anymore, and nothing for a new culture of any kind to integrate into. So a culture like the Muslims would stick together in close proximity, buying houses and businesses and entire neighborhoods, making a community with their own shared values. This larger community, aka no-go zone, is so resilient that even government leaves them alone. All it took was asserting their strength and dominance once or twice, and now there is nothing government can do as they are massively outnumbered. I don't have any opinion on different values that people have, I'm just observing and analyzing how these systems work. The next community structure I want to discuss, I call the farm business. I call this the farm business because 
Going right down to the core of essential human needs is food, water, shelter, and security, which comes from living rural and living close to nature. But this community structure could be relevant to any other business as well. The farm business is an economically viable farm as the community. It is essentially the nuclear family or multi-generational family community structure only with a few more people of the same values included in the community to contribute to the success of the farm. Everyone is living on site or close by including the family and also the others that you bring into that community. From all my research this seems to be the most resilient internal community structure and I have a whole bunch of examples to prove it each with slight variations but all are working very well. My first example is the Pioneer Farm. When settlers came over and established new land, families would get land, clear and work the land, build a house and start producing food. A Pioneer family would then need more help from the, for the farming operation once set up, so they would bring on some farm helpers. These farm helpers would live on the farm, were provided shelter and food, and also given some small compensation for their work on the farm. Sometimes the only compensation was a roof over their head and food in their belly. In my own family history, my great-grandfather was a pioneer. He cleared land with horses, built a house, established his farming operation, and then had farm workers live in a bunkhouse on the farm. This farm site has been vacant for many, many years now, but it's really neat to go back and visit sometimes. The workers' bunkhouse is falling in on itself, but you can see it was just a simple eight foot wide shed with cots on each side and a wood stove at one end. On the farm, they had a well with a hand pump, multiple outhouses, and a lone wood cook stove in the kitchen of the small main house where meals were made and prepared by my great grandmother for everyone on the farm. My next example is a series called Yellowstone with Kevin Coster. On this show, it's about a very large cattle ranch in Montana. For infrastructure, this ranch includes a very large main house for the large multi-generational family, large corrals, large barns, a separate house for the ranch foreman, and a large bunkhouse for all the cowboys. The ranch is surrounded by lots of pasture land, but also isn't too terribly far away from their local town. The ranch is ran by Kevin Costner who took over the leadership and ownership of the ranch from his father when he passed, who had taken it over from his father when he passed, and so on. To establish the initial Yellowstone Ranch, it started with one man with one small family obtaining bare land, building a small house, getting a few head of cattle, growing that herd, hiring a small group of cowboys, and going through generations constantly growing and expanding the ranch to what you see on that TV show. Every generation in that family had the same goal and ambition to grow and keep the ranch safe and in the family. If you haven't seen the show, I won't go into any of the drama or any spoiler alerts or nothing like that. None of that TV drama stuff is relevant for what I'm talking about here, communities. The ranch is ran by the family with the head of the ranch, the man in the family with the most seniority essentially. Under that man, his children are somehow involved in the preservation of the ranch helping with work, legal problems, accounting problems, managing the cowboy workers, etc. The cowboys all live together in a large bunkhouse that has a common kitchen, bunks, a large shared bathroom, etc. just down from the main house. The foreman for the cowboys has his own house that is also on the ranch and not too far from the bunkhouse where he can have his privacy and even have his own family if he wants. On the show, there's lots of drama. The ranch gets essentially attacked in many different ways, both physical attacks and legal attacks. With all of these attacks, the ranch is able to defend itself, largely in part to being established and having many people on the ranch with the same goal to protect it. Some of the children of Kevin Costner's character sort of leave the ranch and go do their own thing, but are also part of their ranch in other ways. Some children went into law enforcement, lawyers, and even politicians. All these roles protect the ranch, likely even better than if they just stayed on the ranch and were a, another working hand. Even the cowboys in the bunkhouse are given a sense of purpose. They like that they're part of the ranch or that the ranch is like an executive club and a, it's a privilege to work on it. These cowboys and ranch hands all have similar characteristics and values. They really like what they do, but they don't have very many personal ambitions like starting their own ranch or even having their own families. 
They're content, they're loyal, and love the cowboy life. In the socio-sexual hierarchy, the cowboys would be considered to be the loyal beta male types. The foreman would be the alpha type male, and the head of the whole ranch would just be the sigma type or the alpha type male. The cowboys do have some alpha type traits, which always leads to infighting and petty pissing matches in the bunkhouse. But the foreman is the do dominant alpha who keeps them in line with rules and the values of the ranch. Another example of a similar farm business community that is very similar to, but also has some different structures to the Yellowstone Ranch example is the Hutterite colonies. If you don't know what a Hutterite colony is, it's essentially a commune of people with the same values, similar to the Amish, except they use the latest technology to have massive farming operations. The Amish live a sustenance lifestyle with no modern amenities where the Hutterites take advantage of all the advancements of humanity. I am personally good friends with the Hutterite colony in my immediate local vicinity for about a decade now. Uh, we are always trading and bartering with each other and I would call them my friends as well. A Hutterite colony is a perfect example of communism that works really really well. Each citizen in the colony doesn't have very many personal possessions. Everything is done for the good of the colony and shared between the colony. There is no individual home ownership, electric bills, gas bills, food bills, clothing bills, vehicle bills, fuel bills, tax bills, phone bills. Everything is provided by the colony as a whole. They all work as a team for the betterment of the colony. One of the binding factors of everyone in the colony is the common values they share. Most importantly, their common religion that ties them together. The colony also instills their values on their own children, so they have a say in raising their own children. There is more support for new mothers with new babies, help is always there when needed, and everything is provided. The colony has houses, a butcher shop, a welding shop, a school with its own hired teachers, a communal commercial kitchen, soap making, clothing making, communal food storage coolers, freezers, and root cellars, storage shops, super advanced chicken egg barns, meat barns, dairy barns, granaries. They have cattle, goat, pigs, horses. They eat together, they work together, and they go to church together. I would say that everyone, including the men, women, and children, are very, very happy with their lives. There is significantly less stress, no worries, and everyone is so kind and always has a big smile on their faces. The odd young person, usually a young man, sometimes think that the grass is a lot greener on the other side and they decide to leave the col colony. Nine times out of ten in a few years the young man comes back to the colony when they discover firsthand the screwed up nature of general western society. Now this is going to blow your mind. This communist colony would not flourish if it wasn't for engaging in capitalism with individuals and other communities outside the colony. In order for the colony to be so incredibly successful, the colony produces much more than it consumes and engages in capitalism to get the resources it needs to both survive and expand. New vehicles, combines, building material, concrete, natural gas, refrigeration equipment, diesel fuel, welding rods, egg cartons, etc. The Hutterite colonies are all flourishing at the same time as small family farms are selling land and can't make a go of farming anymore, essentially unless they get very big or turn it into a corporate farming operation. Now, the Hutterite colony flourishes better than any system I have seen. However, communism does not work on a large scale, and the Hutterites have given me the perfect case study for analysis. When a Hutterite colony gets too big, the colony starts to have problems, even resulting in the failure of some colonies. People may become lazy, values may be put into question or challenged, there isn't enough land and space to have any more houses, barns, shops, their lone school gets too many kids going to it, and their kitchen and communal dining room is maxed out. This is why you see colonies splitting off all the time and starting new colonies. Because communism doesn't work on a large scale, the thriving colony will split in two. The new colony takes resources from the first colony to kickstart the new one. They have tons of money to buy massive plots of land or take over large family farms and expand on those. Some of the people from the first colony will move to the next colony to start this next one. The first colony will help the new colony get all set up. After the second colony is set up, the charity from the first colony starts to diminish then the two established 
colonies engage in capitalism between them. These colonies are so successful, they even expand to other production and other businesses. One colony might get into cabinet making and woodworking, another might get into soap making, running agriculture tin roofing, and even things like producing plastic freezer bags. These colonies are all separate and transact between the colonies, aka capitalism. If another colony gets in some kind of trouble, other colonies can help them in the form of charity if they can. How was the first Hutterite colony created? The Hutterite communes were set up in the beginning from a very small group of individuals, essentially for their own survival. This is by far the hardest part, starting anything, and could only be accomplished by the strongest of men. They were set up because of persecution, essentially. The first men started small, getting a small amount of land, building small homes, a chicken coop, a small barn, and some used farming equipment, and started by selling eggs and meat literally door to door. As they became economically viable, they brought more people into their community and structured it like communism, where everyone contributed, but not for a paycheck, but for the community as a whole. One of the downsides of a Hutterite model is that they are now so technologically advanced, they are exposed to many of the, these fragile systems, some of which aren't sustainable in the long run. Mass scale agriculture is how we feed the world today, but I don't see it working in the long term. My last example of a farm business community is Joel Salatin of Polyface Farms. One of my near-term goals is to be able to talk with Joel about his operations as I think it's an incredible model with so much potential for small resilient communities. Polyface Farms simple overview off their website is to develop environmentally, economically and emotionally enhancing agriculture prototypes and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. It is essentially a model of farming that is not only sustainable, but also produces better food direct to local customers, and it's economically viable. Very similar to what I'm trying to do. There is no middleman. You produce food and sell it directly to customers. There is much less government involvement, regulations, expensive licenses, nonsensical government rules for selling direct to end customers. Never turning the operation into a mass scale agriculture operation, more like diversified small-scale farming. I also like that some of these farming ideas involve entrepreneurship with other young ambitious farmers. If one of the interns has an idea and the ambition to try it, for example a better way to raise meat rabbits or something like that, uh, they can have an area of the farm to set it up and kind of make a partnership. Maybe the main farm would take a commission of the sale of the rabbits, but the young entrepreneur would have much less input costs to get started and the support of the main farm. Some of the risks would be split between the main farm and the young entrepreneur. When my sons get older, they can branch off and make their own systems, but they could also stay on the farm with my help, which makes things a whole lot easier. Maybe one does a larger chicken operation and then another does orchards and a bigger greenhouse and another can start a butcher shop, whatever they want. Each boy can have full domain over their own setups, whatever that might be. There is literally unlimited demand for setups like this, and best of all, it's extremely resilient. Diversifying to multiple different smaller things on the farm, keeping the overhead low, and not having to give all the margins to middlemen, and having a small but loyal customer base, Building up soil instead of degrading it like mass agriculture is a growing system, not a dying system. Now the absolute most resilient system of all would be multiple farm family businesses with similar values living in close proximity to one another. This allows for each leader to have the freedom and control over his domain, multiple smaller thriving communities in close, close proximity producing different things, complementary things, ultimate goal moving forward and maybe the only way moving forward. If you could trade feed, meat, livestock and each produce different varieties of things, even discuss what the farm business does with other surrounding farm businesses to diversify the local area. Instead of having to buy every tractor attachment, maybe you could buy different ones and then borrow them between each other as needed. Tight local thriving communities makes a whole lot of sense. I hope this gave you a whole lot of ideas on what you can do to start your own communities. Start distancing yourself from the larger system that is unsustainable and doomed to fail. 
I would love to have more like-minded people set up farms and homesteads near me and become my neighbors. I continue to work very hard myself, getting busy enough and economically viable enough that I can bring some like-minded help into my internal community as well, as I continue to build and expand and become more resilient. I am calling on all the builders and leaders, and you know who you are, to start setting up your own thriving and resilient communities. From my analysis, it's the only way forward. Thanks for watching. That was a lot of beefy content I crammed into one little video. If it was beneficial to you, let me know in the comments. Or if you think I'm out to lunch or insane, let me know too. I never delete comments as I value freedom of speech and having open discussions. It helps me personally evolve. Like, subscribe, share. Thanks for watching. Take care and get to building. What the heck is this guy talking about? <laughs> like and subscribe.